It's the best sitting up on this chancel because the If ever you want to serve as a reader, you come right on up and enjoy the of Guy's beautiful piano playing. I got the wonderful gift this week of reading and rereading Jane Kenyon's poem. And I found myself chuckling a bit to myself because there's that word let again. Some of you might remember a few weeks ago, we looked to Kai Miller's poem, The Book of Genesis in Worship, where he used that word let over and over again to help us all imagine what life would be if it was the only word we knew, let, let. For Kenyon, let evening come conjures up the same possibility. As the sun sets and the light fades and nightfall descends, let what needs to happen, happen. Stop fighting it. Let the day end. Let the evening begin. Let it all come. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. This poem is both literal and symbolic. The literal cycles of nature and the symbolic cycles of life and death. The living and dyings of life, many of which we experience all the time. What we hold on to, what we are energized by, what we grieve, what we struggle to let go of. Let evening come wisely counsels us to surrender to it all. To be present to it all. Maybe that's what surrender really means after all. Presence. Be present to it all. And do not be afraid. For God, Spirit, your fellows, this precious earth, translate that word for yourselves as you need to. Will not leave you comfortless will not leave you comfortless. But specifically, let evening come invites us to consider what might happen if we give in to the mysterious, unexpected, often unfamiliar blessing that is night. Night, actual, literal, night. And this, my friends, is the season for it, right? The wondrous astronomical events in our midst are what has guided the myth and theology behind rituals and practices that have taken place around the world for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years. For all of our ancient ancestors looked at the night sky and nightfall for direction and for answers, for meaning. Meaning. So just to orient us a bit, right now the sun is a few weeks away from being the farthest south, closest to the southern hemisphere on its north-south kind of trajectory, right? As Earth orbits the sun in its tilted, wobbling way, the amount of time we spend with this sun is waning. The shortest day and longest night arrives on the 21st in what we call winter solstice. And I'm so glad that First Parish makes it a tradition to hold a service on that night and honor winter solstice. I love that about you. So literally, we 
mere passengers on planet Earth are shifting away from the sun. We're shifting away from the light. And it is a remarkable thing to take a minute and consider the global impact this shifting away time has had through millennia. It really is. If your belief centers around our interdependent web of existence, you might consider stretching that web out across time. From the temple of Karnak in Egypt to the ancient Mayan ruins, of Tulum, to the Neolithic Newgrange in Ireland, to Machu Picchu in Peru, and these are just a few structures that just so happen to still be standing. How many more there were that are no longer? All of these ancient ruins, astronomical structures, trace the root of the Earth alongside the Sun, with particular emphasis placed on these shorter days and the winter solstice. I often marvel, marvel at the spiritual heft of these peoples, my ancient people and yours, what they must have been inspired by, what spiritual heft. Can you imagine what it took to measure this? Trace these planetary and lunar movements, and then to build these sacred sites by hand with such passion and precision, such acuity. And I do wonder if some of that spiritual heft and inspiration had anything to do with being in the dark, literally, for a lot of the time. It might explain why so many of our sacred texts across religions often place the greatest of visions and mystic experiences at night. I wonder. That's our theme next month, by the way, wonder. So I'm preparing the way. The fact is that for most of us modern folk, we could probably count how many times we have known, really known, complete natural darkness, literal darkness. I, I probably have about three or four memories of being in nature in complete and total darkness. Our planet is so overlit that if you looked at a satellite image of Earth today, you'd see that most of its surface is covered by artificial light. Very few of us have seen the Milky Way in all its glory, or ever seen what the night sky really looks like and feels like if it weren't for all the artificial lights. Many call this light pollution. Statistics show that more than 60% of the people on the planet and 99% in the U.S. and Europe exist under a yellowy, artificially lit up sky. This is why that heavy, thick kind of darkness that only some of us have experienced is so unfamiliar. It's just unfamiliar. The truth is we are hooked on light, hooked on it. And this is a result of industrial civilization, where our electricity has kept our factories and workplaces, streetlights, porches, stadiums, construction sites and businesses lit up 24-7. Many of us, myself included, have become so dependent on it that complete darkness might even feel unnerving. For most of us, it also feels tiring, right? How many of us bemoan the time change where night comes earlier is feeling like an energy suck? Yeah. And this makes sense. We have adapted as human beings 
to energy as being akin to light. But our biosphere isn't meant to be illuminated at all hours. The natural rhythms of day and night and the changing light is embedded in the biological makeup of all life. And we are, alongside all of Earth's living things, equally dependent on darkness for health as we are on light. Seeds can't germinate without the absence of light in the soil. The caterpillar is cocooned in darkness so that it can metamorphosize. Composting requires a protection of soil or a dark container to do its wonderful work of alchemy. We were cultivated and brought into being in a dark womb for nine months. Just a few examples of the life-giving power and energy, an energy that is darkness. Honestly, this new phenomenon, new being the key word, of light, dependent, light dependence is troubling to me. I do wonder what our spirits have lost in this. Consider this. In 1925, only half the homes in the U.S. had dependable access to electricity, a hundred years ago. And how about this? Humans lived on planet Earth for 600,000 years before discovering how to make fire. 600,000 years. Wow. It's not difficult to see why time spent in the dark was once so very meaningful. A lot of time was spent in it. In its full potential, night is the great balancer. Without the cacophony of lights and fluorescence, it offers us a daily reprieve, a slowing down, a silencing, rest, sleep, more sleep. And as I said earlier, I often find the shorter days wholly inconvenient. It slows down all the things I need to get done. And I often complain about it making me, me, feel, me feel more tired. But what if that's the point? What if that's the point? Maybe it's nature's great divine prophetic memo to us, and it arrives every single day, and most of us just keep sending it to the junk folder, myself included, ignoring that there's something vital and healing for us in the dark. Don't worry, it'll come tomorrow if you keep sending it to the junk folder. It just keeps arriving. So here we are in what many call the season of light, but which I call the season of darkness. Blessed, divine, healing darkness. The kind we need. Need. We are waiting for the light, sure. We are preparing for it. But we're not crossing off days to get to it. We're opening little doors, like on, our, on Missy's Advent calendar, right? Opening windows and doors. We don't light these Advent candles to blot out the darkness. 
We light them to remind us of what is possible in it. What is possible in it. I would say that this preparing the way time mostly has to do with readying our hearts and souls for the blessing that is evening and the great wisdom that waits for us in it. And paradoxically, we are made better able to see the light, to know the light, when we have come to know the wonders of the dark. And now I'm speaking in metaphors. And maybe this feels wildly abstract to you. Hang in there. We are going to stay with this all month. And I encourage you to do the same. Stay with it yourselves as seekers. But this is the spiritual invitation of the season. Judeo-Christian and pagan symbolism and metaphor and myth speaks to the heart of what it means to be human in this big, big universe germinating, metamorphosizing, gestating, being alchemists, digging deeper into the literal and symbolic imbalance and balance that is this season of changing light and darkness. That's what it's all about. And taking all of this in and applying it to every facet of your life your precious life. That is the spiritual invitation of the season, my friends. There's meaning in it for us all. And so my question to you this morning is simply this. What preparations do you need to put in place to make this seeking so? this digging deeper possible? What preparations do you need to make for this? Let us not go mindlessly through this season just skimming the surface and bearing it. What might you need to let in or let go of to make the wonders of early evening just that. Wondrous, wonderful, meaningful for yourselves. What might you need to let in or let go of to let evening come and not be afraid? Hmm. So I hope you will take those questions with you or reach out to me if you find yourself completely perplexed by them. That's what I'm here for. Let's listen to Jane Kenyon's beautiful words again. That'll be good. Let evening come. Let the light of late afternoon shine through chinks in the barn moving up the bales as the sun moves down. Let the cricket take up chafing as a woman takes up her needles and her yarn. Let evening come. Let dew collect on the hoe abandoned in long grass. Let the stars appear and the moon disclose her silver horn. Let the fox go back to its sandy den. Let the wind die down. Let the shed go black inside. Let evening come. To the bottle in the ditch, to the scoop in the oats, to air in the lung, let evening come. Let it come. 
as it will, and don't be afraid. God does not leave us comfortless, so let evening come. May it be so.